Okay, hi everybody. Uh, today is uh, extra material, but for those who are interested, I will talk a little bit about multivariate ETO calculus. And not surprisingly, you will see uh, objects as you've seen in uh, uh, multivariate standard calculus. So remember that, uh, well, we're working with Brian Motion, obviously. And now uh, what we're going to do is work with actually several Brian Motions that are independent, okay? And we're going to take D of them. And we're going to, if you want, write that as a big BT, okay? Of, which has, which you can see as a vector with D coordinates, okay? And now this is a process uh, as T varies. This is no longer in process in R, but it's in a process in RD. Okay, so it's good to do a picture. So let's take uh, R2, and what happens is uh, at T equals to zero, what you're gonna start at zero because both Brian motions starts at zero. And as time evolves, you're going to take steps. So now I'm going to exaggerate, right? So you're going to take steps, okay, where the x coordinate is given by b1 and the second coordinate is given by b2, okay? So the steps, how you are advancing, are given by the two Brian motions, the x. So how you move horizontally is given by B1, and how you move horizontally is given by B2. So if you think about that, as time goes on, since B1 goes like a Brian motion, it goes up and down, it oscillates quite a bit, and B2 oscillates quite a bit, you're going to get past like this. All right? It's going to go move around. Okay, so I get a path. in R2, okay? So what we had before for one dimension uh, is only a path in, so in R, and D is equal to one, my Brian motion was starting at zero, and then it was moving, if you want, horizontally. Now you're gonna say that's not how you actually wrote things, that's true, uh, because what we did is essentially add an axis, the axis of time. Here I only have the axis of space, okay? So if I write now, this is this picture, so if I write time, and this is my space, which is R, now I can, if you want, open this path and really get something that we usually see. Now, what I did in this picture is just no time axis. I just did the movie, if you want, as I move on. And so it's the movie on that axis you see. Okay, so that's one dimension. Now, as time goes by, if I look at several dim dimensions, so the movie would be that this uh, particle, if you want, moves in the plane and goes on like that, all right? Now, do we have an ethos formula for this? And the answer is yes, okay? And ethos formula, I'm gonna do an example. Ethos formula can be used to uh, get a really nice results, which is a result due to Levy, about transients and recurrence of that path, okay? So what's the question of recurrence and transients? So let's do it in that picture. So I start a Brian motion. So as time goes by, this particle, which is the red particle, moves on the plane. Now, where does it go? Does it actually escapes to infinity and never comes back? Or that would be transients. Or infinitely often, it actually comes back close to where it started, the origin and then moves away again, and then comes back and moves away again, okay? We actually solved that question in 
1D. So that what do we know in 1D? We know that any Brownian path hits any level. That means that here in my axis, I go arbitrarily far from zero, okay? But that also mean, okay, that I go arbitrarily far in the negative. So my path go they go like this, right? So they go arbitrarily large and arbitrarily small in the negative. So you actually cross the origin infinitely often. That's what you see here. So is that the same thing here in 2D? Do you go arbitrarily far and come back close to where you started, arbitrarily far and come back? And the answer is yes in dimension 2. But it's no longer true in dimension 3, 4, 5, and beyond. So in higher dimension, Brynian path, so in 3 dimension I cannot do it, but in 3 dimension I would just at some point escape and never come back close to where I started. So one and two are very special, they are recurrent, whereas dimension three and beyond are transient. All right, okay, so that's the objective. Now, we need Ito's formula to do that, and so to do it, uh, like any Ito's formula, I need two things, the Taylor approximation and the quadratic variation, right? So let's start with the Taylor approximation. So if I take a function that is has two derivative in RD, so I'm going to write it in D dimension, what is the Ito, uh, Taylor approximation of the function at X with D coordinates? Well, it's where I started, F0, I develop around 0, plus the all the first derivative, Okay, evaluated at zero times uh, x um, times x uh, i minus zero plus all the second derivative sum over all i j delta x i delta x j f of zero. Okay. And then what I would get here is xi, xj, okay? So first order is is actually linear, and then you get quadratic, okay? Now there's a way to uh, write that, okay? So now obviously here I develop around zero, but if I develop around another point, then I would get evaluated at this point, and here I would get xi minus the i coordinate of that point, and same thing here, okay? Now I can write that in a compact way as f0 plus the gradient of f at zero dot product with the vector x, Plus, and now what do I have, the object I have to encode the second order derivative is no longer a vector, the gradient, it's a matrix, okay? And that matrix is called the Essien, so H, I'm gonna write H, so H of F at zero, this is the Essien matrix. Okay, and I get x vector x that multiply that matrix times x. Okay, now there's something missing. It's second order. I should get a one half. Okay, and then this is an approximation to second order. Let's do approximation here. And if I want exact, I have to go beyond. Okay, but for Ito's formula, we only need second order. All right, now what's Ito's formula with this? Well, what happens is that when I do the first order, I'm gonna get the DB of each of them. When I do second order, I'm gonna get the product of DBs. So, but I already know from quadratic var variation that when I take DB of a given Brown motion, let's say the ith one, with itself, I get dt. 
So that's for when i is equal to j here. When i is not equal to j, it's what we call the cross variation, and it's an exercise, not that hard. So now instead of adding the square of the increment, I take the product of the increment. This is actually zero if i is not equal to j, okay? So I actually have new rules of stochastic calculus. This is what I have here in chapter six, okay? So look that everything is zero, all the dBs are zero with each other, and when they're the same, the diagonal, I get dt as before, okay? So with that in mind, we can guess what Ito's formula should look like in differential form. Okay, so I could add the time too. I would let's just do the case where um, I have only a function of space, which is all the Brian motions. I have D of them. Okay, so I write this as all the coordinates as B arrow to so have the, all the coordinates. So df of bt would be the gradient of f evaluated at the point bt dot dbt. Okay, I will say a little bit more what that means. Plus, now if you think about this, so what's the Asian matrix again of f? On the diagonal, you get the second derivative of the first coordinate, the second derivative of the second, etc. And I get the mixed derivative on the diagonal. But I know that these, the dBs, if their difference are equal to zero. And therefore, the only thing you pick up are the second order derivative, uh, the diagonal terms here, okay? Not the mixed derivative. So I will get sum over i equals one to d, the second derivative with respect to the i-th coordinate evaluated at bt, dt. Okay, so that's my Ito's formula, okay, in that differential form. Now this object as a name, when I take the sum of the second derivative of a function f, I can write that as delta f, and that's called the Laplacian. Okay, a lot of names here, new names maybe, Laplacian, and that was the Eschian. Okay, now what does that mean? Again, differentials make, means nothing. What means something is the integral form. So that means that function evaluated at the point BT, which is a point in RD, is equal to, now the gradient inner product with DB, it's the sum of stochastic integral. I have one for each prime motion, okay? Okay, so I have D Ito integrals, but each of them we know what an Ito integral is. The only difference is that we have D of them now, each on a different Brian motion. And that function depends on all Brian motion. Okay? And I have a Riemann integral, which is the integral from 0 to t, of the Laplacian of f bt dt. And now I forgot my one half. Thank you. All right. All right. So let's move this. A little bit below. All right. This is my Ito's formula in RD. Very nice. Okay. So this is what is done here. what is written here, okay? Now I also add the time. What the time does, it gives me an extra term in the dt, okay? Now, again, like before, we know these are 
martingales whenever what I integrate is nice enough. And therefore, if what's inside here is zero, we have a martingale. And that gives me a PDE for F. That's a very nice PDE. It's actually very close to a PDE called the heat equation. And um, yeah, so whenever delta EF, delta TF is equal to minus one F, the Laplacian of F is zero, then it's a, we have a martingale. Even better than that, if I have a function that only depends on the space, okay? That means that this is zero, and so I have a martingale when the Laplacian of F is zero. Those are very important mathematics and physics and nature in general. Those are called harmonic functions. Okay, so whenever I take a harmonic function of bar and motion, I have a martingale. That's extremely, extremely elegant. All right, now let's apply what we learned to resolve this problem of recurrence of transits of the path. Okay, so there's a lot of harmonic functions in every dimension. There's one particular one, okay, that are uh, special the harmonic functions that are rotationally invariant, okay? So this is what I have here. So what do I mean by rotationally invariant? They are only a functions of the distance to the origin. So the distance to the origin is this, okay? In dimension two, those are log of x, okay? And in higher dimension is the length norm of x to the power 2 minus d, okay? Now, of course, if I multiply this by a constant and I subtract actually a, a linear function or a constant, this is also linear, uh, also harmonic. So ahx plus b is also harmonic. We're going to need that. All right. So let's solve that problem. So here's the theorem. Now I'm going to explain. So you have a Brian Boshin BT and RD. Okay, so those are the paths in RD. Let's do the picture. Okay, so let's say in R2, I start at zero. So actually, I'm not going to start at zero here. I'm going to start at x. OK? And the question is, do I always go back to a neighborhood of the origin? Let me do that in other color. OK, so I take a little ball of radius r. And the question, does my path actually go back, go to the origin or not, depending on x, okay? So tau r is the first time, it's a stopping time, the first time Brian motion starting at x hits the ball of radius r, okay? It enters that ball, okay? So of course, with this uh, definition, so I can write this like this, the distance is smaller than r, and so in my picture, the picture is suggested, so we take actually x, the distance to the origin is bigger than r, so when I start, I'm already outside the ball, okay? Now here's, the question, so the P of X is property of Brian motion starting at X. The property that the time, this time is smaller than infinity, so eventually I get inside the ball, is one. That means every path gets very close to the origin with a property one. But it's not the case for dimension smaller or equal to three. This probability is strictly smaller than one. And so there are paths that actually 
never enters that ball for any R. Okay? So we are recur recurrent in dimension two and transient dimension three. All right, so how do you prove that? You find a good martingale and use optional stopping theorem as usual. So here's the picture. So I'm going to do another picture, I'm going to blow it up. I'm going to define another. I'm going to define two. So I still have this little R. And I'm going to take a bigger one. Oops. Ah, look at that. A nice circle, huh? Actually, I'm going to redo this one just for fun. Voila. Okay. Now, this is bigger radius, big R, okay? And X is in between. Okay? And you have this Brian motion. So, till R is the same as before, and I now I define till big R to be the first time X is actually bigger than R. So, the, sorry, the first time the Brian motion exit the ball big R, so the first time BT is bigger than, than big R. All right, and we're gonna take R tends to infinity eventually, this big R. All right, now I'm going to define a martingale. So, which is H, a function of Brian motion. Okay. How do I find the function H? I want H to be harmonic, so the Laplacian of H is zero in the annulus, which is defined by the two blue circles. And what are my boundary conditions? So H of X is equal to one if I'm on the small annulus it's equal to zero if I'm on the big one, okay? And I'm going to take also that H is rotationally invariant. Okay? Now, because of Ito's formula, I know that if I take a harmonic uh, function, this is actually a martingale. Okay? And so I have that the expectation of my martingale at any stopping time is the same as the, fun the martingale at zero. That's optional stopping, sampling. Now, what stopping time do I take? I take the minimum between the two. That is the first time I hit the boundary of the analyst. Now, if I rewrite this, on this side, my brown motion starts at x, remember? So it's h of x. And what's h of b tau? Well, it's a, I can only take two values because I stop at the small, the inner radius or the outer radius. 
So what I get, and the outer radius is zero, so I get that this is the probability uh, that the distance when I stop is little r. Okay? Which, in other words, is the probability that little tau of r is smaller than tau of big R. Okay? Now, this function h obviously depends on the annulus, so it depends on little r and big R. Okay? So this depends on little r and big R. And remember that what I want is the probability that when I start at x, so I should put x here, because my brown motion start at x, I want to take the limit when the outer radius is really big, and then if you want, I can use continuity of the probability or something like that. This is actually the probability that I want, the probability that eventually I entered the small radius, okay? So the problem is reduced to computing the limit when r tends to infinity of that function evaluated x, right? That function, I still don't know what, I, what it is, but it's this function. It's the harmonic function with these boundary conditions, all right? So I know, so here I'm using some knowledge that we have a harmonic function. So the harmonic functions are rotationally invariant. I wrote down before. So hx, so if, if d is equal to 2, pick hx is equal to a log of x plus b. And if d is equal to 3, I take a h of x. 2 minus d plus b. Okay? Now, what's a and b? Well, it depends on, on the boundary condition. So I'm just going to tell you the answer. It's actually right here. Okay? So I'll just write it down. So th again, this is just finding A and B using the boundary condition. So I have two equations and two unknown. So I get that for D equals to two, H of X is log of big R minus log of X divided by log of R minus log of little r. And for D, bigger or equal to 3, this is bigger or equal, this is r to the 2 minus d minus x to the 2 minus d. So note that the only thing I'm doing is finding a constant a and b, okay? And this is what it is, okay? So when x, the distance is little r, so here it should be the distance, I get 1 here and here, and if it's bigger, I get 0 and 0, okay? Now, what happens when I take the limit r tends to infinity of the probability that tau r is bigger than tau r, smaller than tau r? It's the limit of this h of x, which depends on big r and little r, even though it's not in the and so what it is, well, it depends on the dimension. If the dimension is 2, this limit, if you think about it, this dominant term here on the numerator is log of r, okay? And this is also log of r in the denominator as r tends to infinity, so the limit is 1. However, it's not the case where in dimension bigger or equal to 3, because 2 minus d is negative. So when r tends to infinity, big r tends to infinity, this goes to 0, and this goes to 0. So the probability is the distance of x to the origin divided by r to the power 
um, 2 minus d. Okay? So actually, uh, this is bigger than 1, so you can write it like this also. d minus 2. So what's inside here is smaller than 1. Okay, so that's for d equals to 2 and d bigger or equal to 3. So that proves that in dimension 2, we're in the transient case, every pass will enter any ball around the origin. Oh, sorry, so it's rec recurrent, rather. So this is recurrent. And in dimension 3, we are transient. Some path will never enter the ball, they just escape to infinity. Okay? So that's uh, the proof of, uh, of the Levy's theorem on transients versus records. Now let me just do a comment about what we did here. We found a harmonics function in a domain. The domain was the analyst. Inside the analyst, the function was harmonic, and we we actually impose boundary condition on the boundaries of the analyst, the inner and outer boundary. This problem has a name, more generally, it's called the Dirichlet problem. So here's the Dirichlet problem. I want to find a function, so I have a domain, okay, an RD, so that's in the plane, that's O. I want this function to be harmonic inside O, and I prescribed Okay, I impose some boundary condition G. So this is actually known. G is known. What I don't know is inside. I know the boundary. I don't know the inside. Now, it turns out that stochastic calculus gives a representation for the solution to the Dirichlet problem. Okay, the same way that we did. So what's the value of the function at a point Y? It's the expectation of our all Brian in motion path that starts at y. So you start Brian path at y, and then you stop them when they hit, hit the boundary. Okay? So at the stopping time tau, first time you hit the boundary. And then you record what's the value of your function at that point. And you average that over all paths. Okay? So you take the average over all paths. And it turns out that the value of the function h at the point y is the average over all Brian paths starting at y of the value of the function g where you stop. Okay? So if you're actually very close to the boundary, the value of the function will be very close to the value of the function close to that point, right? Because you're more likely to exit close in that sense. This is important actually in, in, in physics because uh, it turns out that heat behaves that way. That is, if you put some temperature, fixed temperature on the boundary, okay, and you wait for some time, and you ask what is the temperature at a point Y inside, well, it turns out that the temperature will be the solution of the Dirichlet problem, okay? So this is a very nice, very nice uh, relation, again, between stochastic calculus and PDEs. Okay, thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed it.